Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome. Thanks for joining us for the MV lecture tonight. Uh, welcome as well to everyone who's joining us online tonight. Um, I think a lot of people have uh, checked out the weather and elected to actually stay at home for this one. So we'll have a, a modest in-person audience and we've got a, a large uh, at-home audience joining us through Zoom. But Woman Jacob, welcome to Melbourne Museum. Um, I'd like to acknowledge before we begin that uh, Melbourne, uh, Museums Victoria works across the lands of the Wurundjeri and the Boonwurrung people of the Eastern Kulin Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging uh, and any first people joining us either on in person or online tonight. Um, I'm, my name is Jonathan Shearer. I'm the General Manager of Science Works, our museum in Spotswood. Uh, it's my pleasure to be your host tonight for the lecture. For those who are regulars, you'll know that in the MV lecture series, uh, what we do is try to connect the public with the important and wide-ranging research that we conduct ourselves as Museums Victoria or through our collaborating researchers. And it's a real pleasure to have that second category, collaborating researchers with us tonight from Deakin University. Um, I'm really delighted to be the host because this is a fantastic project that we've had going at ScienceWorks and uh, it's, it's one I can't wait for more people to hear about. I won't tell you too much about it, but I will say that the project we're talking about tonight, which has been happening at ScienceWorks, is all about generating new information on the origins of and influences upon children's eating behaviours. And ultimately, the, the kinds of findings that are coming out of this report will be used to support families and communities to raise children who eat well. Um, as I said, though, I'll leave it to Georgie and Tracy to talk more about the project itself. I'd really like to talk about why this partnership with Deakin actually um, was established in the first place and how important it's been for science works and its mission. So a little bit about um, how we've run it. So within a space at science works within the exhibition area for the general public, um, the, the group have taken over that space for a school holiday period usually to conduct a study with the visitors who come through the museum. And so uh, we, over a school holiday, we get about 30,000 people through science work. So a large number of people, uh, either participants of the study or at least are exposed to the study. And that's been super helpful for us. So as far as a mission goes, ScienceWorks is really uh, an institution who uh, tries to promote scientific literacy for everyone. There are people who are, become interested in science and will go on and pursue STEM careers. And obviously it's important for them to be exposed to these kinds of experiences. But there's a certain level of scientific literacy I think it's important for everyone to have. If you don't understand how science is conducted, the kinds of things it can tell you, the things it can't tell you, how you can apply those kinds of findings, Things, then there's just so much of the world that's shut off to you. And even if you never plan to be a research scientist yourself, to be able to read an article about a study and understand, you know, a little bit about how they um, undertook that study, understand the importance, to look at issues we're facing in our world and to have a sense of what are our possible ways forward, you know, even when it comes down to being an informed citizen um, and, you know, the choices you make around who you vote for and the issues that are important. There's a level of understanding of science I believe we all need. And I think it's so important to have this partnership where we conduct a scientific study on site. People could be participants within that study and they could also chat to the researchers and have that education moment where they understand what is the process? Why are they conducting it? Why is it important? What kind of things might they find out? And the last reason I think it's been so successful as a partnership from ScienceWorks' perspective is we know that one of the main reasons people feel like a STEM career is not for them is that it's not discussed in a positive light within the home. And so if you're not chatting within your family group about science and how fascinating it is and the kinds of things it can do, for lots of people that rules it out as an option as as could it be something I'm interested in? Could it be something I pursue? And it's our hope that if a family comes to science works uh, for a, you know, a fun day out and participate in an active study as part of that day out, 
we've gone that little step further towards actually having people discussing science within their home in a positive way. And the groups that tend to fall out of that STEM pipeline, so there's a lot of emphasis on women in STEM and how we need to actually address those gender barriers, but it's also true of Indigenous kids in STEM. It's also true of people from multicultural backgrounds in STEM. Often it's how it's discussed within their family that becomes important. And I think the fact that we've partnered with Deacon several times now, it's just, it's to me, I get excited every time because it is bringing science, true science into those families' lives. But I'll stop waffling about science and we'll get to the meat of it. We'll get to the actual presentation. So the structure we're going to have tonight um, is we'll have a presentation from Georgie and then Tracy, and then we're going to open it to a general Q&A and discussion. Um, so the way we're going to manage that is if you're joining us online, we really encourage you to submit your questions through Zoom. And our staff here, Kate Phillips, will be able to grab the mic and she'll be able to actually ask some of the online questions of our speakers today, but for our um, in-house audience as well, we can do hands up and ask directly to the panel. I will ask though, because we're recording this one, um, if you could wait for a microphone to get to you before you ask your question, that way in the recording, we actually capture the question as well. Um, beautiful. Well, it's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers. The first is Dr. Georgie Russell, who's a senior lecturer and behavioural scientist at the Institute for Physical Activity and Nutrition at Deakin University. And her research is aimed at providing insights into the origins of and influences of eating behaviours um, with a view to identify those opportunities for encouraging people to eat well. And the areas she focuses on include eating behaviours, food decision-making, and healthy and sustainable food systems. And we're also joined by Tracy Lee, who's a PhD candidate at Deakin University. And she researches uh, eating behaviours, particularly fo focusing on food fussiness and its origins. And I suspect that's going to be a real hot topic in the questions, because certainly when we discussed it internally, we were fascinated by some of those fussiness uh, questions as well. Um, so Tracy graduated from the University of Minnesota in the US with a master's degree in food science, um, but as she's worked in a range of countries, she's examined food functionality, food acceptance, eating behaviours from a range of different perspectives, and that includes food science, sensory science, but also psychology. Um, so we'll start with Georgie, so please welcome Dr. Georgie Russell. Okay. Um, we have a bit of an interesting system going on here with two kind of clicking things. So apologies if, I, um, if I'm not quite in sync with the slides, but I'll, I'll do my best. So hello, everyone, and um, thanks for the opportunity to be here to talk to you today about this fantastic collaboration that we have with Museums Victoria and ScienceWorks. So as Jonathan said, my name is Georgie Russell, and this is um, my PhD student, Tracy Lee. So before I begin, I wanted to thank Jonathan and Kate Barnard, who's here in the audience, who we've been working with on this project, along with their teams at ScienceWorks, and of course, all the children and adults who've come along and visited us in the STEM lab to take part in the study. So I'll start by giving a bit of a background to the project and an overview of what we've been doing so far. And then I'll hand to Tracy, and she'll talk a bit about her PhD work on fussiness before I'll share a few more insights and thoughts, and then we're happy to answer any questions. So um, we've tried to keep our talk fairly short so that there's more chance for um, Q&A at the end. Okay. So what is the big question that we're looking at answering here? Why are we doing this study? Broadly, we want to know more about children's eating behaviours and what influences them in middle childhood, so the primary school years. We start learning about eating when we're babies, where we only consume one food initially, milk, and then into the toddler and preschool years, we're exposed to more foods and more influences. In these early years, families and perhaps childcare centres have a lot of influence on what's available for children to eat, when they can eat, and who influences them. But as children get older and progress into the primary school years, children have more autonomy and are subject to a wider range of influences. And this then increases further as they move into adolescence and beyond. 
So middle childhood or that primary school age is an interesting period of transition. The brain is continuing to develop. There are shifting responsibilities in families. Children are spending more time away from home. It's a kind of bridging period between those early years when children have less say over their eating environments to those later years where children have much more eating autonomy. So our research with ScienceWorks focuses on this age group. We're trying to understand firstly, what are children's eating behaviours in this age group and what can explain their development? We want to know what sorts of eating behaviours should children be learning about in middle childhood to set them up to be healthy eaters later on. So while a lot of our research is about understanding the processes and mechanisms underpinning children's eating behaviours, there's a real practical element to our research as well. So if we look at the information that's available and the advice that's available to families around healthy eating, there's a fair bit in infancy and maybe some into the toddlerhood um, years, but then it really drops off. So what should we be telling families about how to support children during primary school about healthy eating? So in order to be able to do this, we need to know the current state of children's eating behaviours, what sort of eating behaviours are important and how they develop. And that's where we focus. So I've used the term eating behaviours a number of times now, so I'm going to explain a little bit about what we mean by that as that's um, what we put a lot of effort into looking at. So by eating behaviours, I mean how children eat. So it includes how they think about food, how they behave around food, uh, what they eat, why they start eating and why they stop. It includes things like how much children find food rewarding, whether children eat slowly or quickly, whether children eat for emotional reasons, how attuned children are to feelings of fullness and hunger, and whether children like to try different foods. So eating behaviours are interesting because they affect the types of foods children eat as well as how much they eat. So they're the precursors to dietary intake. And they also tend to stay with us as we move into adolescence and adulthood. Um, also, eating behaviours, for the most part, are something that can be changed. So this is something that we can support children to develop. Interestingly, we've also noticed that there are large differences between children in eating behaviours, even within the same family. And we wanted to know more about why this is. Ultimately, we hope that by understanding differences between children in their eating behaviours, we'll know more about how and why eating behaviours arise and which combinations of eating behaviours are helpful to support healthy eating. This will enable us to better target any advice or health promotion activities to the specific needs of children and families. Okay. Okay. So another related area that we look at is called appetite self-regulation. So we think there are a range of processes, thoughts, behaviours, actions and emotions that can help children to eat well. And we look at these under the umbrella of appetite self-regulation. So just like in other areas of development, like emotions and behaviours, effective appetite self-regulation is important for children's healthy growth and development. So... Effective appetite regulation might involve things like being able to select healthier options from a range of foods, selecting appropriate portion sizes, and eating to according to hunger and fullness cues. To do this, children need to be able to know when they're hungry and full. They need to be able to resist tempting foods, know what is healthy and select this even when unhealthy foods are available know what a suitable portion size is for them, given their hunger levels, and resist those portion sizes that are too big, even when they're available. And then there are other things, like not using foods to manage emotions, thinking about the longer-term consequences of eating behaviours, and trying to get feelings of reward from other things that don't involve eating. However, we've noticed that many of the indicators or measures of appetite self-regulation actually get worse as children um, move through childhood. So this is curious as children get better at self-regulating many other aspects of their social and emotional lives as they get older. And so this is something that we wanted to explore further. Now it gets a little bit more complicated. <laughs> Um, so the way that we're looking at appetite self-regulation is with this 
what we call the bottom-up, top-down or dual process model. So I'm presenting here on this slide our working model of how we think appetite self-regulation might work in children. So essentially, there are two interacting systems occurring in the brain that influence appetite self-regulation and decision-making around eating. So on this slide, you can see we have the top-down and regulatory processes and the bottom-up um, processes down the bottom. So some of you might have read that book called Thinking Fast and Slow, which describes two systems of decision-making, system one and system two. So this is a similar idea with system one being the bottom-up and system two being top-down. So bottom-up processes are fast and automatic and top-down processes are slow and deliberate. And there's an interplay between the two systems, as you can see with this double-headed arrow on the slide. There's a back and forth, so they influence each other, even during the process of eating. Um, and in terms of bottom-up processes, we classify them as either avoidance or approach. So a bottom-up avoidance um, process would be things like not wanting to eat a food you know, maybe finding a food disgusting or off-putting. Approach things are like feeling temptation or wanting to eat a food. So it's that kind of impulsive desire to eat things. Whereas the top-down processes are regulatory. So they're decision-making processes like inhibitory control or the ability to suppress bottom-up processes. So similar idea to self-control. Um, so appetite self-regulation involves overcoming through the use of those top-down processes, these bottom-up responses, whether they be approach or avoid, in favour of a goal directed to healthy uh, food selection and balancing energy intake. Going to get a little bit more complicated. Oops, I'm not clicking the right thing. Um, sorry. Um, also influencing appetite self-regulation is what we've called here the biological infrastructure. It's a very strange term, I, I know. But it's basically the biological aspects that regulate appetite, um, like homeostatic and hedonic uh, mechanisms, taste preferences like an innate taste preference for sweet, genetic predispositions, and things like food neophobia or the fear of new foods. It also includes brain responses and processes such as how children react to the rewarding aspects of palatable foods. These are important because they can have an influence on the bottom-up avoidance or approach responses and how children respond to food cues. Then we have um, the things that prompt eating or elicit the bottom-up response. So these are things uh, like the food and eating cues, which can be either external or internal. And these three things interact to influence appetite self-regulation. And there's also large differences between children in each of these aspects. So I'll give you an example. So um, let's say a child sees a brightly coloured, appealing-looking soft drink. They think it looks delicious and refreshing. So these are external food cues, like down the bottom of the slide. So they'd really like to have this soft drink. So that's the bottom-up approach response. Um, they're also feeling pretty thirsty, which is also an internal cue. This particular child might find food especially rewarding. So these impulses are strong in this child. So this bottom-up approach response is quite strong. But a child with good, strong, top-down regulatory processes might recognise that this is not a healthy choice and opt for, let's say, water instead. Or they might think, I'm going to a party tonight and there's going to be um, you know, other kind of sugary drinks there, so I'll wait till then in a kind of delay of gratification response. A child with weaker top-down regulatory processing would probably consume the soft drink. Um, in the case of an avoidance, so an example might be um, a child being offered a meal that looks a bit unfamiliar to them. Maybe it has some green things in it or maybe some slimy looking things or something. Um, perhaps this child is also quite fussy. This would elicit a strong bottom-up avoidance response. Um, if this child's told that the food tastes just like other foods that they're familiar with, that the foods are good for them, and then if they were to try it, it would actually be um, quite a pleasant experience. Maybe the family is eating the food as well and enjoying it, so there's some role modelling. A child with strong top-down regulatory processes would then over be able to overcome this avoidance response and eat the food. One with weaker top-down processes could probably not be convinced to try the food. 
So appetite self-regulation is complex and there's a lot we don't know. For instance, we think that different children might be good at some of these things or all of these things, and this could have different outcomes for children. So, for example, a child might be not so good at selecting appropriate portion sizes or paying attention to fullness cues when they're eating, but they're really good at waiting until they're hungry until they start eating again. Another child might be really good at stopping when they're full, but they cannot resist tempting foods when they're offered. So what does this mean for their diets? We actually don't know at this point how it all works. However, we do think that the development of appetite self-regulatory abilities during uh, childhood can assist with the consumption of healthy foods in appropriate amounts. Okay. So we also recognise that eating behaviours are complex and it's useful to look at them from a range of perspectives. So in our work with Science Works, we're looking at a variety of factors across biological, psychological and social and environmental domains. We also look at different types of foods. So across the different activations, we're looking at um, a range of different factors, including these that are on the slide. Because of this, our research team is also really diverse. So we have people across all of these different areas of expertise, including uh, virtual reality specialists, dietitian, marketing expert. We have a communication design expert, an epigeneticist um, and metabolomics expert, sensory scientists, psychologists, food scientists and statistical experts. So it's a very multidisciplinary project. And our view is, the eating, is that eating is something that's influenced by a wide range of factors and research that looks at combinations of these factors will provide a clearer picture of eating behaviours and what influences them. So some of the questions that we've been trying to answer with our um, work at ScienceWorks are these. So what are children's eating behaviours in middle childhood? So how well are children doing at the moment? What are they learning? Um, what are they not doing so well at? Are children showing signs of being able to self-regulate appetite? Which eating behaviours and eating behaviour profiles are associated with healthy out outcomes for children? So we're also looking at profiles of eating. Um, and what affects children's eating behaviours and appetite self-regulation? So trying to understand what are the influences on appetite self-regulation and eating behaviours, and also how can we better measure eating behaviours? Okay. Next slide. So what have we been doing with ScienceWorks? So as Jonathan mentioned, I think we uh, began our collaboration back in 2019 and then began collecting data in January 2020, so just before the pandemic hit. Um, we've been collecting information from parents and other caregivers and children aged between 5 and 12 years across two activations with a third plan for later this year, so the Term 3 um, school holidays. For us, this has been a great opportunity to reach a diverse sample and the children who come and see us are already in, immersed in science, being in science works. So it's a great time to get them to participate in a science study and talk to them about nutrition and eating behaviours as a science. Some of them don't believe me that I'm a scientist that looks at eating. Anyway, um, it's, good. it's good to talk to them about it. Um, the research activities we've designed involve children doing a range of things. So, for example, preparing a meal in virtual reality. They've done game-like behavioural tasks on iPads. They've looked at different food packaging designs and made choices. They've had their tongues measured, which Tracy will talk about later. And they've also tried different foods and told us about um, the texture and the taste. So the children uh, participate in a range of activities. And those those caregivers who are willing to do a questionnaire for us and all of these activities and the questionnaire are linked through an ID, uh, ID code. So across the activations, we're building a really rich um, data set with a lot of in-depth information on children's eating behaviours and influences upon them that will provide a wealth of information as we continue to analyse it. So it's a unique study that's providing a lot of new insights into children's eating behaviours in middle childhood. So here's some photos from the first activation in 2020. So you can see it was quite busy in the, um, in the STEM lab. We had great interest in participating in the study. Um, children were really willing to give all the different activities a go. Um, and it was also a great chance for our, we had a lot of our undergraduate students do an internship with us. And we had three PhD students working on this project. So it was a really 
big project and um, lots of really good scientific uh, insights coming out of it. And then we went back, as I said, last year. So this activation was a lot quieter as we'd, we'd just come out of lockdown um, and we had to shift to the weekends. Kate will remember plans A, B, C, D, E and F or whatever we had. <laughs> um, nevertheless, we were still able to run a really successful activation with a smaller group. And we had two PhD students working on this, so Tracy is one of them. Um, so it's really great opportunity for us to be able to collect high quality data. So you can see here the way we've set it up is that each child is um, accompanied by a staff member or a, a placement student who supports them as they do their activities. Okay, so I'm now going to hand over to Tracy to talk a little bit about her fussiness results. Thank you, Georgie. Um, hello, I'm Tracy. Thank you for um, this opportunity for having a talk over here. Um, okay. So... So my PhD work was a part of science, science Works project, as Georgie explained. So I joined both activation one and two, and I completed all the data collections for my PhD in during the science works. So also some of the outcomes of the study has been published in high quality journal articles. And as a PhD student, uh, it was a great opportunity for me to participate in this big project. And then also working with this great people in science works. And also we have this nice volunteer like from Deakin University. And then all the participants of my study, the child and parents, they're from all coming from all different demographic and cultural backgrounds. So I, I would like to take opportunities to say thank you for all of the people who involved in science works project. So, now I'm going to talk about my study. So my PhD is about food fussiness in children, particularly in their middle childhood. So there are many factors that influence um, fussiness in children. So what we are particularly interested in about is that some children are really fussy around certain textures of foods. Um, for example, slimy texture of the oysters and slippery texture of the mushrooms or foods with pieces and beets like smoothie with fruit pieces in it. So, and also the studies from um, other studies also found that these texture perception, food texture perception might be influenced by how sensitive your tongue is, what we call the oral tactile sensitivity. So combining all those three um, concepts, my PhD is looking at the associations between food fussiness and food texture perception and the tongue sensitivity in children. So the first part of my PhD was the measurement of, of the tongue sensitivity. So, so one of the challenges in this area is, was that how we're gonna measure this tongue sensitivity. So there are a couple of measures that used that has been used in other studies, but what we used in our study was that using this little thing, um, it looks like a lollipop, but there, there, if you look at the bottom on the, you can't really see, but there is a lines on the bottoms, the fine lines. So we presented those lines on the tongue on the, of the participants, either vertically or horizontally, and then asked to them, like, as to the orient, as to them to identify the orientation of the groups on the bottom, that how they feel on their on the tongue. Then here are some results. Like if you look at the graph here. The graph shows a nice bell-shaped curve. So what it means that most of children, oh no, sorry. The most of children was able to identify the uh, orientation of the group correctly. So a few of them are really bad at the task, but few of them are really good at the task. So from this, what we concluded that was, oh, this methodology is working. However, what we found from further analysis was that 
um, this measured tactile sensitivity was not associated with any of the child's characteristics, for example, age or gender or BMI. So it was very unexpected and surprising, actually, because we've screened, you know, 2000 tongues. And then for each participant, it was eight times of like presentation on their tongue. It was like, then it's like 16,000 times of tongue screening. So after this all hard work, you would expect to see something there, but it wasn't related to anything else. So what we think um, the limitation might be. So we measure the tongue sensitivity when the tongues are still, you know, not moving. But if you think about what we eat food, when we eat food, the nature of the tongue has to move around, you know, not just still. So the next future study should be followed with how we're going to incorporate this dynamic movement of the tongue in, into this measurement. Sorry, another, another interesting finding from my PhD work was that we found the appetite of self-regulation in food fussiness. So what we, George, explained before, this slide is a part of the modified uh, version of the top-down, bottom-up process. So again, the bottom-up process was involved, um, bottom-up process involves with swift and automatic responses, but the top-down involves with the regulatory inhibitory control over the behavior responses. So from my study, we found that fuzzy children tend to be more shy, fear, and less impulsive, which is driven by the top-down process, but they tend to be less, uh, have less regulatory, regulatory control over their behaviors. So, oh, sorry, missed that all that. And for example, when fuzzy ch children are given with their foods they don't like, they have this strong bottom-up avoidance, but they have lack of this top-down to regulate to top-down regulatory process to overcome this avoidance. So they don't if they're yeah. On the next slide, um, I'm going to give you some summary of overall findings of my study so far. So reminder, my PhD was looking at the associations with these three concepts, food fussiness and texture perception and tactile acuity. So between food fussiness and oral tactile sensitivity, there was no relationship. And then food texture and then texture sensitivity, no relationships. And then the last one again, there was no relationship there. So I know we're expecting so much before this study, but there is no relationships at all. So well, what I want to acknowledge is here that there are many unknowns still in this area, especially about food textures and in relation, in relation to the tongue sensitivity. In sensory science perspective, texture, food texture has been known as forgotten forgotten sensory characteristics compared to the other sensory attributes of the food. For example, taste or flavor has been really investigated well in relation to how that's related to children's food intake or food acceptance. But texture has been just recently like gained attention in academically. So there are many unknowns in, in this area as well. And also, yeah, as I said before about this tactile sensitivity measure, it has been not validated well yet, but the validation part of the research has to come with, with different population of the children or different cultural backgrounds using the same methodology. So there needs to be more studies to follow on this um, topic in the future. And this is my slides to the end. So I'm going to pass over to Georgie again. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. OK. <laughs> Thanks, Tracy. Um, so just, I just wanted to share one other finding um, from the first activation. So what we did in the first activation was it's called a discrete choice experiment. So essentially what we do is we systematically vary different characteristics and then ask children to make decisions between uh, foods that vary in those characteristics. So 
essentially what we did was we varied portion size, um, the food form, so that's uh, related to the texture and the flavour or the type of food. And then we presented children with different combinations of these foods and asked them either which of these would you choose, which of these do you think is healthier and which of these do you think is tastier. So using this method, we can figure out how children are making choices. We can, we can look at what did they prefer or what did they think was healthier, but also what did they base that decision off? So um, what was really, so this is just two examples. So they might see an iPad, you know, with um, four slices of brown bread, which is the large portion size. Uh, the food form is the sliced bread and the type of bread is the brown bread versus um, you can see the, the, that's the middle sized portion of a white bread roll. So they, they're presented with all these different combinations. There's actually only four decisions they make each. And this one here, um, you can see it's, they're both a small portion size but, and they're both the roll, but what they vary in the, um, in the flavour which is also related to the healthiness. So what was interesting from looking at these results, and I'm just presenting the results from the bread here, we also looked at smoothies as well, um, was how they decided. So these are results that uh, through the analysis that we did, we could say, well, what's influencing their decisions? So what are they basing these decisions off? So you can see uh, essentially how they decided what they prefer it was essentially based on the type. So was it white bread or brown bread? Um, how did they decide what was healthier? It was also based on the type, white bread or brown bread, and the same with the tastiness. So what they didn't use was the portion size. So you can see the relative influence of por portion size to these decisions is really small. So uh, we find that quite interesting. So I think it makes sense that children are focusing on the, you know, whether it's a white bread or brown bread because that influences flavour. Um, with the smoothies, we had a chocolate smoothie, a berry smoothie and a green veg smoothie and the results are very similar. But what is interesting is that children just really don't use portion size at all. So um, in terms of focusing on children's eating behaviours and what um, we think children need to learn, we actually think that portion sizing and understanding different portion sizes is something that we can spend a bit more time on. And we're actually following this up with um, other parts of the activations to look at, well, what are children learning about portion sizing? Um, you know, how do they know what's about the right amount? Who is actually thinking about portion sizing and selecting appropriate portion sizes? So at the moment, you can see it really doesn't factor into their decision making. So they would rather have one slice of something, um, one slice of white bread than four slices of brown bread, for instance. Um, so that was quite interesting to see how children are making decisions. Um, in terms of where we're going in the future, so um, as I said earlier, we've got heaps of data from these first two activations that we're still analysing. So Trace has been quite productive in publishing her results. We're still working through a lot of the other ones. Um, we're coming back in term three, this, the term three school holidays this year. So we'll be back in the STEM lab again. Um, we're looking uh, into doing maybe more of a citizen science approach. So rather than the children participating in the science, um, asking the children to actually be eating behaviour scientists alongside us. Um, we'd really like to explore more about appetite self-regulation and understand um, how we can raise children who are able to regulate their appetite well. And we're also spending more time on translating our findings, so making them accessible to various audiences such as yourselves. And that's it. Thanks, uh, Georgie. Thanks, Tracy. Um, I love this project. And I think when I talked at the beginning about why it was valuable for science works to have primary research happening on site, it was, you know, in general, but I think the magic of this particular partnership was as far as the kids were concerned, this was fun. Like they, they were, um, I, I think a lot of them just thought it was one of our school holiday activities because they got to try out VR. They got their tongue tested, you know, even at the end, they, they got to pick a snack as a reward for taking part, but which snack they chose was part of the study. So I think, um, the team, like Georgie's team worked really well on, this, yes, it's a study. Yes, they, they want the right data to be able to investigate what they want to investigate, but is it the right experience? And really thought about making it a science works experience, which is really awesome.
Um, I did a quick question from me before we go to questions from the audience. Uh, I did talk a lot about what the value to science works out of this partnership is, but Georgie, quick point from you. Um, like what value to you and your team and your research came from actually partnering with science works rather than doing this traditionally at Deakin? Thanks, Jonathan. Um, is this microphone working okay? Yep. Yep. Um, well, one of the big challenges for us in doing research on children is finding people to participate in our research and especially finding people from a, a range of backgrounds. So um, often our research studies are quite skewed to a certain um, demographic who's willing to come and visit us in Burwood, um, usually a very highly educated kind of sample. And we, we see that, you know, throughout the world. Um, so being at ScienceWorks and I guess taking our research, you know, to that particular context is really valuable for us in terms of reaching a range of families. Um, as Jonathan said, there's, you know, large uh, numbers of people who, who do go to ScienceWorks in the holidays and we're able to, to talk to many of them. So that's really valuable for us. Um, as I mentioned, we've had three, three PhD students work on this project, so we are able to collect really high-quality data. So being able to set up a range of activities all in one go and having, um, you know, the families come through has been really valuable. And the other thing I would say, Jonathan, is, um, you know, we don't, as academics, we don't always get the opportunity to, you know, have a nice chat to the people who are participating in our research. And we do get that when we're there. So we have a chance to chat to the to the children and to the parents. There's usually lots of questions around eating and, you know, why is my child fussy or what are you actually measuring over there and that kind of stuff, which allows us to really connect with, um, with the families, which is really nice. Mm, awesome. So any researchers out there watching us who want, you know, 2,000 participants in a two-week period, definitely get in contact with us. <laughs> Um, beautiful. So we're going to move on to questions now. We're going to start with a question from our online audience, I believe. Hi, hi there. Thank you, Jonathan. What a fascinating talk. Um, really great to hear about your research. Um, we have Kat on our online audience wanted to know if there's a correlation between fussiness in toddlers and uh, fussiness in middle childhood. Uh, she has a, a two-year-old um, who refuses unfamiliar food. Um, so fussiness is a really interesting one because um, it looks like it kind of peaks. So the, um, most children are, well, fussiness is generally peaking around the kind of toddler ages. So it's not surprising that, you know, the toddler is a bit fussy. But what we see from there is there's different trajectories. So this is, I guess, relatively new information. And Tracy's research has shown that the prevalence of fussiness in our middle childhood sample was actually quite high. It was around 50 percent, wasn't yeah. it? Um, which was unexpected because traditionally we thought that fussiness sort of petered out after toddlerhood, and for a lot of children it does. But there are what we see are these diverse trajectories across childhood. So I'm not sure which trajectory that that child is going to be on. It could be on the trajectory where you know the fussiness diminishes as they get older, but other children, you know, it might persist into middle childhood. Fantastic. And a, a follow up question um, from another uh, online uh, participant is um, how can we encourage kids to try new foods? Um, so a fussy child that wants to, that doesn't want to try a new food. So we, we presented our kind of new information around how we think some of those decision uh, those decisions work. So if we think about a, a, a fussy child or any child that's presented with something that they don't want to eat, the way we now look at it is that, well, that's that bottom-up avoidance response. So they see it and they don't feel good about it. You know, they don't want to try it. They feel reluctant. Um, so I guess what, what would help are things like trying to diminish that response. So um, perhaps that's, you know, involving them in the cooking or something like that. So it's a bit more familiar, giving them some say over what's... Um, you know, they're going to eat, presenting a range of things and so not just the unfamiliar sort of scary looking thing. So that's, I guess, diminishing that bottom up 
response. But then we have the top-down regulatory stuff. So all those things around, you know, thinking through, well, what's this going to taste like? How am I going to feel? Are other people eating it? You know, that sort of regulatory capacity as well. So that's the way we're thinking about it now is either kind of uh, trying to reduce that bottom-up response through perhaps familiarity, modelling, um, you know, those sorts of things, at the same time as helping children, you know, develop that regulatory capacity to say, well, I know I don't feel so good about that, but, you know, but mum tells me it's it's similar to this other food that I had before and then, you know, developing that capacity to overcome them. Fantastic. And there was a this related follow-up question, which is um, are there any influencing techniques which are detrimental um, to kids experimenting and trying new things? Sure. So um, what we see in the literature around parenting and how parenting, parent feeding practices can influence children's eating behaviours is that um, those sort of more coercive or pressuring type feeding practices or uh, so rewarding children for eating. So, you know, if you do, if you eat this, then you can do that. Or if you don't, uh, if you eat this, then you won't have that, you know, those kinds of things. Um, are effective in the short term. So the child may eat that food in the short term, but in the longer term, um, you're diminishing the child's liking of that food and willingness to eat that food in the future. And I think that's always the challenge for parents is, um, you know, we all want our children to eat well and eat healthily today, but we're also thinking about how can we help them, you know, learn to like a range of foods and so on in the, in the future. Um, so um, in general, those sort of pressuring, coercive sort of strategies are less effective to develop, you know, that willingness to try a range of foods. Um, and what is more helpful are things like modelling, um, providing some structure around eating, so maybe having the three meals and the two snacks in, in a day. Um, I think, you know, as parents, we often put a lot of pressure on ourselves to do all the educating around healthy eating, but there's lots of peers and other grown-ups that we can draw on. You know, when you go to someone's house, you go to the grandparents' house or whatever, if healthy foods are presented, then that, that sort of thing can help or in peer kind of situations as well. And I see my wife's technique of just lying to them and saying everything is chicken, not good. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that. <laughs> Um, beautiful. Thank you, Kate. Uh, we might go to the room then. Are there any questions um, from our in-house audience? We've got a couple, so we'll do one at a time. Uh, if you could just wait for the microphone, that'd be great. Um, yeah, so just wondering about the top-down regulatory processes. Are they always positive? And what do you mean by positive? Well... You, you eat this because it's healthy. They can be equally negative to say, well, I'm not going to eat this because of some, um, what their peers are doing, and they're making decisions about how I will present to peers, and that would be a top-down process. Yeah, I guess the way we look at um, top-down processes is they're usually um, helping you achieve a goal. So, um, you know, if it's healthy eating or balancing your energy intakes, you know, that kind of thing, the top-down processes are, um, you know, helping you avoid those uh, kind of um, automatic responses to say, well, hang on a minute, the better choice is this. So I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean in terms of positive. I'm not sure I've answered that correctly. <laughs> just... Yeah. I'm sorry. I guess I was assuming that top-down processes are, are undertaken in a certain part of your brain that develops and is different to the immediate and instantaneous responses. Mm -hmm. But those, those type of responses can be telling you the opposite. Um, they're not interested in being healthy or not. They're, they're interested in something, some other factors. Okay, so you're saying my goal is to um, fit in with my peers that's, that's and correct. to do that I need to all eat all these unhealthy foods or yeah. whatever. Or I know I've got control of my parents. And, and <laughs> I would really love to eat it. But my taste is saying I really want it. Mm. I know I'll get something out of this. I'll mm. buy something. Mm. You know, I'll only eat it if you do something for me. 
Yeah, I, I'm not sure, but I think um, so because we look at it in the sense of appetite self-regulation, so I guess we're looking at it in the positive sense. So how can you self-regulate? So if you look at, um, you know, we're interested in how you can learn healthy eating behaviours and those sorts of things. So I understand what you're saying. I guess we look at it in a slightly different way. Um, so for example, we're in this food environment where there's heaps of unhealthy foods. They're pretty cheap. They're big portion sizes. There's lots of advertising. So we think that's eliciting these bottom up responses and to be able to self-regulate in that environment, you need these strong top down, um, regulatory processes. If your goal is not to self-regulate appetite, then you're probably looking at a, a different model, maybe. Beautiful. All right. We had a question from over here. We'll just wait for the mic. Hey there, that was a really good presentation and a re really good study. Um, I had two sort of loosely related questions. Um, my first question was more around, did you have an exclusion criteria around um, the children that you um, that participated in the study? And the other question was more around, um, did you come across kids who were who had like a diagnosed avoidant food, like food resistant type disorders and whether like there were children who was already involved with like seeing a dietitian around food avoidance and things like that? And did you compare them or were they included in the study as well? So do you want me to answer? Well, we yeah. all included all the uh, children with autism and also, yeah. And then we just included everything who have, but not dietary restrictions or anything who have food avoidance tendencies. Like we don't know about that information, right? So, yeah, I think in the first activation, we didn't collect that information. And then through talking to a lot of the parents and, um, you know, other caregivers who were there and they kept telling us all these uh, things, you know, how those kind of conditions were related to eating and so on. Um, so then we started measuring it in the second activation and we'll continue to measure it. And it is, you know, the, you, you sound like you know about the area. It's actually a really interesting area. So we'll, we include those children, but we're interested in, um, you know, how they do respond to all the different tasks. Um, and in terms of the exclusion criteria, so we just ask children to be between five and 12 years and that they can understand, they need to be able to give, parents need to be able to give consent and the children need to be able to assent. So they need to be, they need to be able to understand what we're asking them to do and tell us that they're okay with that. So um, we, we check that before we include them in the study. Um, but otherwise, um, the only other reason why they, their data might be excluded for a part of the study is if, um, you know, they're participating in an activity and maybe the parents come along and choose that one or choose that one or something <laughs> like that. And then we have, to, um, we have to delete that. But that's otherwise we just include everyone as long as they can understand the tasks and what we're asking of them and they can provide consent. I, I will interject before your second question. Um, I've been involved in a few museum research partnerships. And one of the issues you have is if it's being presented as an activity available for all visitors, but the study isn't, um, the poor researchers have to spend a lot of time with kids who can't actually inform their data set. Um, I don't think that was a big issue for you guys, but some of the previous ones I'd done, um, you know, it's like, oh, it was really, you know, busy day, but unfortunately a lot of the kids were too young for our study, but they still were allowed to take part because that's part of being, you know, conducting your research within a museum. And you, you had a follow-up, I believe. No, that was both my questions answered there. Oh, yeah. cool. Awesome. Great. Um, questions, more questions. Otherwise I've got one that came up from our internal team that, uh, I, I might throw to, All right, I'll, I'll, we've got a question at the front. Beautiful. We'll wait for a mic. Um, hello. My background and where I work in is in early childhood education. Um, so I definitely felt what you were talking about um, in terms of those spaces and particularly the earlier years, which isn't exactly the purview of your study, um, about the influences that role models have on children's eating habits. Um, and... I'm not sure if I even have a particular question or if you'll be able to talk to what um, uh, I wonder about within my profession. Um, but I think a lot about um, 
not only in general uh, regarding like praise um, and, you know, these conversations we have about uh, the realities of unhealthy eating uh, and life in general aside with children, um, but around praise and encouragement around healthy eating and eating in general with children, um, I can see uh, the potential for um, good and bad, depending on how it's conducted and with the with the language used. Um, so I'm just wondering in terms of, um, you know, uh, children perhaps being encouraged uh, too much to make decisions um, from a, like a top down approach perhaps um, because of, you know, basically uh, being um, uh, set up and sort of programmed in a way where they're making healthy decisions, but perhaps in it to the point where it becomes unhealthy. Um, and if there's anything that's been part of the literature you've read um, or anything that's been part of this, um, research that you can, uh, I guess, add to um, the discussion that I've got going on with um, within my own head there? That's a really interesting question. So when you say you've seen the type of praise have different effects, what, what have you noticed? Um, so, for example, um, so I don't believe children um, should ever uh, be exposed to food as a bargaining chip um, or as something that can be used as a threat or, or as a reward. Um, just because I don't believe that's the, obviously it's not the purpose of food. Um, and, uh, especially at least in my own personal experience, um, knowing people with eating disorders, um, and hearing about their childhoods and some of their own experiences within childhood, um, I try and be very careful with that language, but it's really not uncommon for, um, I've seen parents do it. Um, and I've seen other educators do it, although I've addressed that, um, at the time. Um, but it's incredibly common part of our society for children to have food, um, you know, be dangled, um, and to be used as, as I'm saying, you know, um, as a threat or encouragement. Um, and I'm just wondering whether, um, that's, yeah, I guess a part of your research, um, something that, uh, you've read within literature, something, whether that it even is prevalent within, um, the conversations around, um, children and eating. Yeah, it is. Um, and it's a really good question. And I agree with you that it's, kind of part of the habits in the way that we parent I think in, in countries like Australia a lot of us um, use food as a reward or as a, or as a bargaining chip and it's essentially because it works so <laughs> children children will respond to you know food as uh, you know as a punishment or as a reward you, you can have this if you do that or you will not get it unless you do that or you know um, and from what we know from the literature uh, you know, that should be discouraged if you want to promote healthy eating. So one of the things um, is in relation to we call emotional eating. So that's eating to help manage your emotions or in, in reaction to emotions. And often these are um, negative emotions. So, um, you know, children, and that's a learned behaviour in childhood, depending on how food is used. So if it's, if it's used to manage emotions or it's used a, as a reward, it gets tied in with that emotional response and the management of those emotions. So, um, and that's not something that we want to encourage because a lot of adults struggle with emotional eating. Um, and I, I think we saw a lot of that in lockdown as well, you know, people eat to, <laughs> to comfort themselves and, you know, to feel good. And it, and it does work. But um, it's preferable to use other <laughs> strategies. Yeah. Um, and then if food, you know, using food as a punishment as well, that, that also encourages. So what we want to do is encourage children to like a range of foods, to enjoy eating, um, to enjoy eating healthy foods, uh, you know, to, to know when they're full, to, to know when they're hungry, those kinds of things. So when you start using food for other reasons, it can dis disrupt some of those processes or, or not encourage their healthy development. So using food as a reward or as a punishment, you know, falls into that kind of bucket of, you know, food is then used for other reasons. Yeah. Um, so it wouldn't support the healthy development of eating behaviours. Yeah. 
And there, there is a fair bit of literature around that. Okay, great. Hmm. <laughs> Do some digging. Yeah, exactly. Um, we'll do our last couple of questions because we're coming to the end of our time. Kate, did we have anything submitted online? Um, yes, there's one here. Um, junk food is everywhere, but why are some kids uh, able to resist temptation? Ooh. It is true that junk food is, is everywhere. It's really easy to access. There's also a lot of marketing to kids these days, you know, on bus stops online, um, even in, in schools and childcare centres, we see it um, sometimes. Um, and it's true that some children are more susceptible to those influences than others. So we talk about food approach and food avoidance, um, you know, tendencies. So some children are naturally more towards the food approach side and some children are naturally more towards the food avoidance side. And so, for example, Tracy's research looking at um, relationships with fussiness and there's a whole lot of um, research from other countries as well showing how it's linked in with um, genetics is that we, these are natural tendencies. So the children who are more sort of to the food approach side, so they, they might be really affected by food cues in their environment. So they, they, they notice them, they want the food that's being advertised and they find it difficult to resist. And that's their, you know, they find food rewarding, they find um, eating enjoyable, those sorts of things. And those children struggle more in the, we call it the obesogenic food environment than those other kids who are, are naturally less interested in food don't particularly find food as rewarding and can just sort of take it or leave it. So um, that's, we call that behavioural susceptibility theory. So depending on children's sort of biological and genetic makeup, some of them are more susceptible to overeating depending on the food environment that they're in than others. Thanks, Georgie. Great. All right. I've got one more. Oh, you got one more? Okay. Um, did you consider um, sensitivity to bitterness, uh, like in um, things like vegetables? Um, the, the, um, the, the, the person was wondering whether that was a significant difference between children that was perhaps feeding into their, their um, preferences. Yeah, well, bitterness is one of the big challenges in, like, children's liking of fruit and vegetables especially for vegetables mm. so to well what's the question again do we measure bitterness no we didn't measure the bitterness of the sensitivity mm. but there are um there are large uh, volume of the evidence showing that the bitterness is related to the food acceptance of the specific vegetables and also food liking of the you know bitter vegetables and the fruits related to food so we didn't measure it because we were focusing on texture um, as something that's, I guess, less well explored. So bitterness, there is a fair amount of literature. The next activation in um, later in the year, we're going to go and look at taste again. In particular, we're going to look at um, preferences for sweet and salty tastes, as we know that's also related to children's um, food intakes and eating behaviours. All right, well, we might go to the last question. I'll throw it open to the room since we've had a few online questions. Uh, if no one's got any more, I'll jump in with one we had. But, oh, we... oh, there you go. Kaz has got the last question of the night. Hi, great presentation. Thank you. Um, do you think we're becoming more fussy? Like there's so much more variety these days as compared to 50 years ago. Are we becoming more fussy eaters? <laughs> I don't know is the short answer. Um, it was a weird question. I, didn't I think, <laughs> I think there, we have um, maybe more choice these days so we can, we can get away with being fussy, can't we? Mm -hmm. Because there's lots of other options available. Maybe, you know, in previous, um, you know, generations we didn't have a choice. It was this is what's available mm -hmm. and whether you like it or not, you're going to eat it. And maybe we were more hungry back then as well. We weren't snacking as often and having all these energy-dense um, foods. But as far as trends over over time I'm not sure so I think um, you know we know there's a genetic component to fussiness that's quite strong um, so that would maybe suggest that the fussiness is um, relatively stable in the population but I don't know sorry Cass. Can't oh, that was a pretty pretty good answer <laughs> <laughs> brilliant well last call did anyone have a final thought or question they wanted to share 
Okay, thank you. Well, thank you so much, George and Tracy. It was absolutely fascinating. As we talk about that idea of, you know, people need this awareness of how science works and science literacy and how partnerships between public, uh, you know, science communication organisations and researchers work so well at this. I think one of the things, again, that made this just a really perfect first partnership for us is it's an area where we all have our own story. And I know anecdotal evidence is the bane of, uh, you know, a large research study, but we all have our own story. But to look at the process of what does that look like across a population? How do you find that out? Is your story everyone's story? You know what? I think it was really fascinating to people to see the bigger picture rather than you're so immersed in the eating habits of those immediately around you. And I think that's a, a great thing for us as a science museum to be able to share. Um, I think in terms of uh, future directions, these are the kinds of things we can explore, something that's personal that you care about, but to look at how science addresses this as a bigger picture. Um, so I'd like to thank our speakers tonight, not only for speaking tonight, but obviously for all their work they've done with science work. So can we have a big round of applause for Georgie and Tracy? I've, as I said, I, I, I love this project. I love talking about this project and I hope this project and relationship goes on for quite a while. Thank you very much.